please be seated <coughs> and turn with me again if you will to the New Testament portion that was read to us the 22nd chapter of the gospel according to Matthew and my intention this morning is to look at this portion of Matthew's gospel and we looked at the account in this same gospel of the incarnation on Thursday evening. But I intend throughout this month to link up the first and the second comings of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's so vital that we do this, not only because the Bible clearly affirms both, and that one cannot really understand the first without the second, or the second without the first, but because the world at its best likes to think about the first coming of the Saviour, but to ignore any significance about his return. But the scriptures are very clear with regards to the two, and it's important that we do our best to make the world in which we live conscious of these great and important tr truths. And we cannot deny, can we, that um, the world loves Christmas, but not Christ. They like to have their lights, but not the light of the world. They like to have their fun, but not faith in the Saviour. And that's the problem that we're up against. Therefore, it's even more important, I believe, for the Christian church to be even more vocal, to be louder in trumpeting forth the truth of the gospel. Because it's so easy to be anaesthetized from reality by the fantasy that is generated, as well as the frivolity, if not triviality, in many people's minds. But you are uh, utterly disabused when you turn to the actual teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So let us look at this parable of the wedding feast. And I hope you notice the remarkable parallel between this chapter and Isaiah 65. I'll have occasion to uh, bring out one or two particular details with regard to the parallel between the two passages because Isaiah had the thankless task of proclaiming the gospel to God's ancient people and for the greater part they rejected the overtures of mercy and so the Lord Jesus Christ takes up the same theme that when he the saviour of the world comes into the world uh, we do of course rejoice that there were those who did receive him the shepherds did the wise men did, Anna, Simeon, and so forth. There were those, but in great measure still, led by the politically correct leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests, they wanted nothing to do with Jesus of Nazareth. What a tragedy that was, and it continues to be a tragedy. And uh, the Lord Jesus shows the huge ingratitude there is of which people are guilty when they reject the message of the gospel. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So let's look at this chapter then and we will see first of all the wedding and then secondly we'll see, we will see the worthy and thirdly the warning. First of all then, the wedding. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Almost the same sentiment that Isaiah expressed in his particular chapter, chapter 65. And uh, then verse 4 focuses upon the heart of the ingratitude of those who rejected the invitation 
to God's mercy. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted calf are killed, all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his business. There is no doubt here that the Lord Jesus Christ in this parable format He's vividly presenting before us the, the course of history, in a sense. Going back to the Old Testament, when God, through the prophets, he sent his servants to Israel in order that they might be wooed and won to the faith and the love and the worship and the obedience of the God of Israel. And yet we know from the Old Testament that although it's full of wondrous revelations of truth, wonderful example of God's mercy, yet there is that downside of the whole Old Testament history that time after time after time the professed people of God rejected him. They rejected the prophets. They persecuted him. They would have nothing to do with the message. And then, of course, we know some time after Isaiah came Jeremiah and the other minor prophets and then it was but a short step to the judgment of God upon Israel and upon Judah when they were taken captive into Babylon. So when you and I find it sad that we do what we can to preach the gospel, to win people for Christ, we shouldn't altogether be surprised that unless God comes with mighty reviving grace, unless he comes with the great outpouring of his spirit, which did occur at times like the Reformation and in certain periods occasionally in the 17th century in Europe and in Richard Baxter's ministry in Kidderminster and so forth, but certainly for a number of decades in the 18th century through the Methodist revival, uh, God has done and he can do again. He can break through and melt the stubborn hearts of people and bring them to the cross in faith and repentance. And it's because of that mere possibility that we press on undaunted and undismayed. So here then really is in this story an account of God wooing people, of seeking to win them by his gracious uh, invitations. And we see the Complete generosity of God's grace here. Look what we find there in verse 4. Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted calf are killed, and all things are ready, come to the wedding. Now there is no doubt that weddings at this particular time were great affairs, great family and great social affairs. And there were particular customs observed uh, in the process. And the invitation uh, went out to all the guests. And uh, they uh, responded to the invitation. Generally speaking, that was the case. But on this case, the wedding of the son of the king, clearly God the Father has sent his dearly beloved son into the world. The son of God who came to woo us and win us uh, to the blessing of salvation. Uh, come to the wedding. And one must see the, the universal generosity that is here. The provision of grace and redemption. We must be very, very clear about this uh, observation. As if to say that even for those who rejected the invitation, the food was on the table. It was steaming, it was ready to be consumed, so to speak. The servants were there to wait upon uh, the guests who had been invited. But here these tables were, were <coughs> empty because the invitation was rejected. What ingratitude! And here the Lord Jesus Christ is highlighting the utter ingratitude of people who will have nothing to do with the Son of the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Saviour of sinners. And uh, what was it that grabbed their hearts and motivated them to reject such generosity, such grace and with such salvation? 
Well, look, the depression of verse 5. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. The affairs and the concerns of daily life, in other words, were more important to them than the invitation to the feast. But they made light of it and went their ways. Richard Baxter, in his uh, mighty sermon on this particular passage, uh, he makes, among many other wonderful and powerful points, that uh, people are lost under the sound of the gospel chiefly because they make light of it. Because there is absolutely nothing wrong with having a farm. There's nothing wrong with having a business. But such activities and pursuits are not as important by far as the importance of the soul. Jesus says elsewhere, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? These people were only concerned about their bodies. They weren't concerned about their souls. And yet the God who delights to give us daily bread... He wanted to give us eternal grace. And for that purpose he sent the Lord Jesus Christ who is the bread of heaven. Who gave himself for the life of the world. So they made light of this gospel. It happened in Isaiah's time. It happened in the time of the Lord Jesus. It's happening today, is it not? And that's why our hearts should weep at the rejection of the gospel. What is worst, in a sense, is when there are people who, as I've said earlier, they like Christmas, but they don't like Christ. Now, I don't deny for one moment that there might well be some who will attend um, the annual carol service in their local parish church or elsewhere, and uh, they might well hear the gospel in a fresh way. And if they're brought to repentance and faith in Christ, we will rejoice in that. But for the generality, one fears that still they make light of it. But not only that does the Lord Jesus make plain, that um, as was the case with so many of the prophets, verse 6 reminds us that the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. The men who had the message, the greatest message that any person could ever hear, the greatest message of all, was hated because those who received the invitation hated the God who issued the invitation and hated the servants who invited them. What a terrible, terrible thing. And what is the height of the ingratitude here? The height of it is this rejection of the provision of the Son of God. And this provision of the grace of the gospel is in the cross of Calvary. That the Lord Jesus Christ came to shed his blood for the sins of the world. John the Baptist reminded us of this, didn't he? In John 1.29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There is a universal provision. As I've said, the food was on the table. It was there available. And people are lost, not because there was no atonement provided for them, but because they rejected in unbelief what is there on the table. This is very clear from our Lord's parable here. What ingratitude and we must pray that the Lord might in great mercy, sovereign mercy, pour forth his spirit so that the great number who trivialize the gospel, who make light of the gospel, that they would come to see it in a personal light, in the light of eternity. Why? Well, because a farmer might be busy on his farm, like the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, and yet one day death will come. The end of his life will come. He might have a flourishing business, and yet he's mortal. One day he will die and others will possess what he gained. There's nothing wrong, as I've said, in having a business. But the chief business of human beings is our salvation. That's what should be our chief concern. And yet this was the absolute tragedy that we find here. So I think we may safely say that as we look at 
the vivid details of our Lord's parable. He's talking about the proclamation of the gospel as it was in the Old Testament through Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and others and so forth. But it also covers the preaching of the gospel in the days of our Lord's ministry. And uh, it was also the experience of the apostles as they went out preaching the gospel all over the world. It has always been so that people make light of it. Now in the case of the Jews, which are clearly partly the targets of our Lord's parable here, there was a dreadful judgment, wasn't there, in the year AD 70. So when we read in verse 7, when the king heard about it, he was furious and sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. This did indeed happen in AD 70, when the armies of the Roman general Titus besieged Jerusalem. The city was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, there was wholesale slaughter, and the Christians who had been living there at that time, they managed to escape in time. They heeded the warnings that Jesus himself gives in the later chapters of Matthew's Gospel, and they went to a place called Pella, and their lives, even physically, were spared at that particular time. But there's no doubt, too, that the judgment of God upon Jerusalem that had rejected in great measure the Lord Jesus Christ, he who was crucified outside the city wall, that that too was a picture of a greater judgment to which this world is moving. And it may be much closer than any of us um, imagine. When the king heard about it, he was furious and sent out his armies destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And then in verse 8, Jesus says, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, and those who were invited were not worthy. The Jews had rejected the gospel. In Acts chapter 13, the apostle Paul, who repeatedly, whenever he went preaching the gospel, he would normally go to a synagogue first and preach to the Jewish people. That was his custom. And then in Acts chapter 13, he seemed to be weary of the rejection by the Jews. And he said to them, since you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now that significance is here anticipated in our Lord's words. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who are invited were not worthy. And this very thought, of course, was anathema to the Jews. They really thought in their self-righteousness that we are the people of God. The Gentiles are scum, they are dogs, they're unworthy. But the Lord Jesus Christ shows that uh, salvation is not about race. It's about grace to the unworthy. And those who are worthy are not those who are intrinsically better because the Gentiles were no better intrinsically to the Jews. We're all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one, as Paul reminded when he lumped Jews and Gentiles together in his opening chapters of the epistle to the Romans. So what then is he saying here? Well, there are those who are worthy, who as sinners receive and accept the invitation to come to the wedding, the gospel feast. So look what we read there in verse 9. Therefore go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found both bad and good and the wedding hall was filled with guests as if to say then the people who thought themselves sufficient and acceptable before God without this wedding feast without the gospel namely the main Jewish establishment they weren't there but clearly there were Various people among the Jews who did accept the Saviour, they're recorded here in the, in the Gospel. So we aren't making a blanket condemnation of 
Jews any more than one would Gentiles. There are some and some in every nation, in every group, as in every church, as in every community. But there were those who heard the gospel and the servants of God went out into the highways. And is there something wonderfully prophetic here because it was a feature of the Methodist revival of the 18th century when George Whitfield and John and Charles Wesley and others came to a saving knowledge of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The clergy on the whole in the early years uh, would have none of it. They turned them out, they complained, they rejected. So what did they do? Well, they went out into the highways, into the byways, and they called people who were often neglected by the clergy uh, to come to the wedding feast, to come to the gospel. And that's how Methodism spread uh, throughout our country. And um, we know that that same century, the 18th century, was the beginning of the great missionary movement, which began to spread in the latter decades of the 18th century and then throughout the 19th century. People going out to all the nations of the world. Although we shouldn't forget that uh, as early as the time of John Calvin, uh, he was very concerned about the spread of the gospel worldwide. In all of Calvin's sermons, whenever he concluded his sermon with his almost standard prayer, his prayer was that all nations of the earth might be brought out of darkness to come to the light of the gospel. So every true Christian will have a global vision. We're not to think little, we're to think big because of the nature of God, the need of mankind, the nature of the grace of the gospel, the provision of the food. Tell those who are invited, see I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted calf are killed, all things are ready. The Saviour must be proclaimed because he is fit and sufficient for every human being. That is the great emphasis that we have here. So God has sent out his servants into the highways and byways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. The wedding hall was filled with guests. Isn't this a, a warning to us to keep on looking outwards? Not to look inwards. Churches that look inward are not only doomed to die, but doomed to incur the wrath of the head of the church himself, who said what? At the end of his life and ministry, before the ascension, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So who then are the worthy? Well, it's the worthiness of grace, not of merit. Look what we find here in verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Rather frightening words, but deeply instructive at the same time, because it was the custom, certainly at those times, for a host who was inviting people to uh, a wedding to supply with every guest a special wedding garment. I suppose not everybody had Sunday best, or perhaps even something approaching that. But on these occasions, all the guests would turn up to the wedding and they would be properly attired. It was a most happy occasion in every sense. Not only the food, but the way people dressed, the way they appeared, a truly happy occasion. And that is what the gospel feast is meant to be, the happiest occasion uh, that ever the world would know. And this, of course, is prophesied uh, in the book of Revelation, the wedding feast of the Son of God, there is going to be a glorious feast uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. But just as here, we need to come to the gospel feast properly dressed. Now I know there are some churches who give the impression of uh, having a dress code. Perhaps there are some churches where a student, for example, who is not perhaps flush with cash and able to buy good garments, uh, would come to a service wearing jeans and other perhaps less uh, attractive features. But um, there should be no such code, should there? 
than ever should be. It doesn't matter what you wear when you come to a service. There are some churches who would insist, at least by implication, that you come, that the ladies all wear hats and uh, the gentlemen wear suits. Perhaps this is a little old-fashioned now. There's much greater flexibility now than perhaps there was at one time. But there's no flexibility here. When you come to the wedding feast, you've got to come with the wedding garment supplied by the host, by the king. And if you're not properly dressed, you're not admitted. So what is this wedding garment? Well, it is, I believe, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, in which sinners are clothed. That's what we have here. It's a vivid picture. The righteousness of Christ which the Lord Jesus Christ earned for us in his sufferings upon the cross. When he died there, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. It was there through his sufferings that he provided us with that robe of righteousness. The blood-soaked robe of righteousness in which we as sinners, when we come convinced of our sin. And embracing the offer of mercy, we are then clothed with. Then, and only then, we are acceptable to God. So, I have to ask you, dear friends, this morning, are you properly dressed in the sight of God? Are you wearing the garment of righteousness? Are you trusting in the precious blood of Christ, by which, as Paul says in Romans 5, 9, you are justified? We are justified by his blood. That is the righteousness that he gives to us by faith. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man who did not have on a wedding garment. Are you wearing the wedding garment? If I were to ask you individually now, how are you appearing in the sight of a God who is infinitely holy and just and pure, who is of purer eyes than to look upon sin, and will not look upon iniquity. I hope you will say, well, 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 God is so infinitely holy, and I am a wretched sinner, and I have a stench in my soul because of my sins and wickedness, but my comfort is in the robe of Christ's righteousness. His precious blood is all my righteousness, and I am clothed alone in that garment. That's the only way. It's the only way of salvation. As the Wesleys found in the 18th century, there were a lot of people, and not only in the Church of England, and some of the more respectable nonconformist churches too, who would almost give the impression that um, they are there and accepted because of their standing in society, because of their respectability and... uh, without any serious blemishes on their characters. And they would rent pews, standing room only for the riffraff, and so on and so forth. That's not how the gospel church functions at all. The true church welcomes sinners of every size and type. And what qualifies us is this wedding garment that you say with Count Zinzendorf, Jesus, your blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my, my dress, in these arrayed with joy shall I lift up my head. That's it. That's our only hope before God. So is that your position, dear friends, this morning? Are you wearing the wedding garment? This man came in, Without the wedding garment, he must have thought what he had was adequate. He was defying custom, but it wasn't acceptable. So in verse 12 we read, So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He he thought for one moment he was all right, he'd get in, no problems of being turned away. But when he was asked that question, he suddenly felt ashamed he realized that he wasn't qualified for entry. So in that sense, he wasn't worthy. Perhaps in his self-righteousness, he thought he was worthy. Because the ones who are truly worthy in the wedding feast are those who don't think they're worthy in themselves, but know that their worthiness is given to us 
through the Lord Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross. We're told he was speechless. He had nothing to say. <coughs> we live in days, don't we, when so many people are so talkative. They shout about themselves. They do this, they do the other. And they're so proud of what they've done. You know what I mean. When people are interviewed about things that they have done, which have caught the news headlines. Yes, I've done this in sport, in politics, in entertainment or whatever. Yes, I'm proud of what I've done. Christian will never say that. Christian says, Lord, I am not worthy, but my worthiness is what you have done for me. So then the parable ends up with a serious and alarming warning. Verse 13 and 14, Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. These are frightening words. And I only hope and pray that uh, churches across the land, and, and not least in carol services, will not only speak of the love of God, but also the wrath of God. It should be done with tears in the preacher's eyes, I freely acknowledge. But we may not, must not suppress the reality of hell, the judgment to come. And only speak of the love of God and sentimentalize the cradle of the Son of God. No, no, we don't do that. Jesus didn't do that. And this is what he's saying. Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. No soft soaping here by the Saviour at all. And is one of the reasons why the secular age of ours dismisses our gospel, our faith, because we do not faithfully warn them of the danger of rejecting the invitation of God's salvation. This surely is the thrust of our Saviour's teaching here. And then he ends up with that verse, verse 14, For many are called, but few are chosen. What is Jesus saying there? He's saying that ultimately, when all is said and done, those who are properly attired, who are accepted guests at the wedding feet, are those who are there because, not that they were worthy, not even that they themselves chose the way of Christ, although we do willingly choose because God makes us willing, but they are there because they are chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world. The truth of divine election is the ultimate reason why a person is a Christian. And yet people are not lost and damned for being non-elect. They're rejected and lost because they did not believe. That is very clear the case. But I mentioned the parallel between this passage and Isaiah 65, didn't I? Notice what the prophet had said. I have stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good according to their own thoughts of people who provoke me to anger continually to my face. And then he describes the decadence of the religion of Israel at that particular time. And yet within the mass of the nation, there were some in whom God's grace was at work. Isaiah's ministry was not entirely fruitless, though the vast majority would have nothing to do with it. So we have in verse 8, thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it. So I will do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. And then there's reference to divine election in verse 9. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, an heir of my mountains, my elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. So the invitation went out repeatedly, and it must continue to go out 
It is the will of God that it should go out. Jesus has told us to declare good news to the world. He has told us that God loves the world. He still loves the world, even the world that in the main rejects him. So in verse 12 of Isaiah 65, Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not hear, but did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. But we must go on declaring the call. And God's people will be gathered in. Many are called. The world is called. But few are chosen. And that's a very solemn and humbling thought. So the gospel will not be fruitless. Even though in great measure it seems to be. But the question of course on which I conclude this, evening, this morning is very simply this. Are you one of the elect? Have you accepted the invitation? Are you one of God's true children born again of his spirit? And to simplify that, I can simply ask this. Do you believe? Do you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you acknowledge him in all that he is and all that he came to do? Do you trust him for your salvation? That's the important thing. And if you say, Pastor, I do feel unworthy. I do feel wretched. I'm so far from what I ought to be. But I do trust him. I do believe in him. I worship him and I adore him. And I love and trust him. And if you say, I believe in him, faith is evidence of election. So the mystery of election is to be left in its sublime mystery. But how it works out is in the hearts and the breasts of those who hear the gospel. So have you come wearing this wedding garment? So the warning is here, isn't it? It's a solemn warning. It must be proclaimed. It mustn't be diluted. It mustn't be lost or explained away. It is part of the total package of the gospel. Indeed, it's there in John 3.16, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, what? Should not perish, but have everlasting life. So I think you'll agree it's a most challenging chapter in every respect and supremely because it comes home to us personally. Let us be sure then that we're trusting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is all our hope in time and in eternity. And then, therefore, when the judgment to come does come, when we're called to stand before the living God. When, as the Apostle Paul made plain in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, he said, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We've got to go on persuading them. And it's the love of Christ which should drive us in that. In verse 14, for the love of Christ constrains us, he says, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live shouldn't live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That is, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin. To be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Therefore as workers together with him. We also plead with you not Listen to this, not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now 
is the day of salvation. Can you see the wonderful unity of the Bible? Isaiah anticipated our Lord's outreach and ministry and the Apostle Paul obeyed his master in his ministry. So may the Lord grant us grace collectively and individually likewise to be faithful to him who loved us and gave himself for us in time and in eternity. Amen. Our final hymn. We've already had one of Charles Wesley's hymns. This is another Advent hymn, hymn 280, which underlines the conclusion of our Lord's parable. Lo, he comes with clouds descending, once for favoured sinners slain. Thousand, thousand saints attending, swell the triumph of his train. Hallelujah, God appears on earth to reign. Let's sing from verse 2 of hymn 280.
loving Lord, what wondrous grace you have displayed to the human race. How ungrateful are so many. And we acknowledge, O Lord, that but for your sovereign grace, our own rebellious hearts too would have rejected the invitation. So we thank you, Lord, for the efficacy of the working of your sovereign grace in our hearts and lives. May we know more of it. And as we rejoice in it, may we not keep it to ourselves, but share it with others, that those who are still in darkness, still in a state of rebellion, shall be brought out of that state into the blessedness of the children of God. So now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the blessing of the Holy Spirit rest upon us and remain with us throughout the rest of this our short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage and until at length we come to that everlasting rest which Jesus came into the world to win for us and bring us to. Amen.